welcome to our third APSCC webinar. Episode three, video distribution. Is satellite still relevant? I'm Greg Dafner, CEO of GAPSAT and president of APSCC. We are the Asia Pacific Satellite Communications Council, which is the only pan-Asian dedicated space and satellite industry association. We are a nonprofit international members association, and we depend on you to provide the goals and leadership for our association. So if you are not already a member, please join us. And talking about joining us, our annual conference and exhibition had been planned for November 17th through 19th in Manila. But in recognition of the COVID pandemic, we are expecting that we will not be able to hold an in-person event this year. So we are now preparing to do an online conference, but to avoid the likely burnout from doing three days of continuous online sessions, we decided that instead we will be conducting bite-sized, compelling short format webinar sessions starting in August and running until mid-November a conference series to be held once a week for about an hour each session. As a warm up to the APSCC conference webinar series, we are doing four ad hoc webinars. Today's webinar is our third, and we are aiming for late July for our next one, which will focus on China's new space companies. And now for today's webinar. Video distribution, is satellite still relevant? The widespread adoption of video on demand has resulted in many of us spending less time watching linear TV. The distribution of linear TV historically was a key component of satellite broadcast video distribution, but with the shift to on demand services, satellite has had to also evolve. The good news is, the coverage of large geographic areas for one to many content applications has proven to be a challenge to terrestrial content distribution technologies, which in turn has ensured a role for satellites now and for years to come. Our moderator today is our very own Christopher Slaughter, strategic advisor to APSCC. Christopher has more than three decades of experience in Asian media and telecommunications, most recently as CEO of CASBA, the regional pay TV trade association, renamed Avia. Before that, Christopher led independent production company APV from its Hong Kong base and spent more than a decade as a broadcast journalist culminating with his role as Hong Kong and Shanghai bureau chief for CNBC Asia. Take it away, Christopher. Well, thank you very much, Greg. Uh, I'm delighted today to have uh, a couple of excellent panelists uh, joining us uh, to discuss uh, the question, well, the statement really, uh, video distribution satellite is still relevant. Uh, the assertion there rather than the question. Uh, Vincent Lim is the Vice President for Sales for Asia Media for ABS. Uh, in just a moment, he's going to be giving us a, an overview of the situation as it currently stands in the region. Uh, we also have Gerald Wong, who's the CEO of uh, Caton Networks, a subsidiary of Caton Technology, uh, which is obviously in go to, in encoding and uh, data transmission company. Uh, he'll be giving us an introduction to Caton uh, and also talking about uh, the situation from their perspective. Uh, so, uh, this is the first APSCC uh, webinar that we've done on the ON24 platform. Uh, and we'd like to thank ABS for sponsoring uh, this particular event. Uh, the, the, the platform may or may not be familiar to you. Uh, so, as we go through things, um, we'll, we'll be talking with you a little bit as, as needed about uh, various things that may pop up on your screen. Uh, we will a, later, a little bit later on be doing an audience survey, uh, and that needs to be in engaged with, it's rather than a passive sort of sit back and watch, you do need to click on something. Um, but it's easy to get lost 
given the fact that there are various tiles and things that you can move around, and we encourage you to do so. That's the beauty of the platform. Um, we just want to make sure that the, the, the interface doesn't get lost with the other screens. So at any rate, um, for the time being, we're going to start with the presentation, uh, and I'd like to invite Vincent to, to uh, take it away uh, with his presentation, Vincent Lim uh, from ABS. Thank you very much. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining today. My name is Vincent Lim. I'm the VP of Media Sales for ABS Global. Uh, this is a brief introduction for myself. Um, I'm, I have 17 years of working experience in the telecommunication media and entertainment industry. Discovers a whole spectrum of technology of how video or packets of data is carried across the world. Um, yes. So the key topic for us today is uh, essentially video distribution. So I think it's pretty clear uh, to everyone in this forum that Salang has played a very important role in the development and evolution of video in general. Uh, before OTT or VOD becomes widespread, Salang was the key enabler in bringing many of the sporting events globally. Um, as an example, so satellite uh, was the main reason the revenue of Premier League football increased exponentially in the 90s. Uh, in the past, technology was limited. Only one or two channels could be squeezed into a transponder, and media companies had to pay a very high price for video distribution. Channels were contributed via satellite first uh, and turned around in Asia for distribution. As you can see here, uh, all broadcasters then in Asia received the same content. While satellite was expensive compared to the rates today, uh, it was still more cost-effective than the available technology then. Uh, affiliates put up TVROs to receive programs from the few satellites that were distributing these channels uh, during that time. Uh, next slides. Over time, as technology evolves, better compression technology is being developed and the emergence of satellite aggregators have reduced the cost of distribution per channel for broadcasters. This also enabled the creation of local and uh, pro localized programming uh, as channels want to extend reach to new audience and increase advertising revenue streams. At the same time, fiber connectivity to many countries in Asia Pacific have increased with massive fiberization plan from governments. Fiber prices have dropped drastically. On the other hand, new and better technology is being developed uh, to deliver video over the internet. Broadcasters have better options to deliver the various channels across Asia now. Next slide. Today, there are more channels than before and more variety of what we can watch on TV. There are so many localized channels leveraging on the same brands that when you watch the same channel in Taiwan, you don't really get the same contents as you watch that in Singapore. You know, it is essentially a combination of programming rights and the need to suit local tastes that have driven broadcasters to create this localized channel. Of course, the shifting trend to VOD has also created pressure to reduce costs of distribution for these broadcasters as the revenue they gain from linear channels go down. As a result, there can be up to four to five different variants of the same brand or channel at the same time. Putting all up on the satellite can be costly as some markets are not as profitable. As such, many broadcasters seek hybrid solution uh, of local playout, fiber delivery, and satellite distribution for such a requirement. Next slide. To summarize, uh, in the past, during the growth stage of video distribution, Broadcasters were essentially constrained by technology. There were opportunities aplenty, but only satellite was the suitable technology. Satellites with strong neighborhood and ground antenna penetration became the choice of distribution. The reliability of this satellite also gave broadcasters a peace of mind. Today, broadcasters are constrained by market. Certain markets have completely dropped linear channels, with, while some markets in Asia Pacific is still thriving. As such, various feeds are required to satisfy the demand. Countries such as the Philippines and Indonesia are advertising focused, 
while Singapore has a completely different requirement. Next slide. The, I think the need to use a combination of technology is obvious. The question really is where and what to use. Uh, let us examine the merits of each of this distributing technology. As we know, satellite works well in one to many applications. Uh, this was this has also explained why satellite has always been synonymous with broadcasting. Uh, while the cost is higher, its fixed cost allows broadcasters to grow revenue by signing up affiliates without the need to increase costs. Satellite also works well in geographically challenging countries like Philippines and the Indonesia, where many islands are spread across a large area. Fiber and internet delivery technologies, while cheaper in cost, are more suitable for one-to-one -one applications. This type of connectivity is prone to cut due to many different reasons. Hence, it is less reliable uh, for live application like linear channel. While it is cheaper initially, the cost increases as more affiliates sign on. Some broadcasters have a rule of thumb, right? Uh, threshold of a number of affiliates before using satellites. Uh, in the past, the number was probably closer to 10 affiliates. Uh, these days, the threshold is probably a lot higher. However, some markets are unique. Uh, a market like the Philippines have many local MSOs and affiliates. In fact, more than 150 of them, uh, the last I count. Rendering other technology almost impossible if broadcasters were to reach all of them. If you're going to design a channel meant for the Philippines, satellite is probably the only option. Next slide. Satellite distribution is essentially a learning curve business. It may take a long while to build up competitive advantage in the market, designing not just the right mod code for the MCPC platform, but also ensuring the right antenna sizes to be seated on the ground. As a late comer to the market compared to the other satellite operators, ABS focused very much on developing key markets, which we believe will continue to use satellites for the foreseeable future. So what, what you see on the left, the ABS-2 Eastern Hemisphere Standard C-Band Beam is used primarily to distribute localized channels in three key markets, Philippines, Indonesia, and Taiwan. In these markets, ABS-2 has full coverage, guaranteeing broadcasters full penetration to reach their affiliates. In our market, home market of the Philippines, we even see the large receive antennas in the past giving ABS the ability to push for a more aggressive mod code, thus resulting in higher bit per megahertz for this MCPC platform. Uh, on the right of your screen, the ABS-2 KU band Southern Beam is popular with free-to-air channels because of its wide coverage and the need for smaller dishes to receive them. Uh, this beam is suitable for any local channels looking at wider reach and coverage especially with like religious or news channels. We have teleports and partner teleports in all three markets mentioned above. Broadcasters with channels intended for each of the market above can easily pass on the transport stream and plunk into the respective country-specific MCPC platforms. Next slide. At our flagship teleport in Subic Bay, the Philippines, ABS provides a comprehensive broadcast facility to enable video distribution. The teleport is equipped to support services including downlinking channels from a host of satellites, playout, add insertion, encoding, encryption, multiplexing, uplinking, and monitoring services. Next slide. An experienced team of broadcast personnel is also staffed in Subic 24-7 to monitor and operate the services on behalf of our customers. Many international and local broadcasters trust ABS to operate and distribute their channels in the Philippines and regionally in Asia. Next slide. So uh, I'll, I'll conclude this presentation now uh, before we go to the next discussion, 
So I would like to, to say that while development on that SVOD continues unabated, linear TV remains a key part of many broadcasters' business. It is important that we choose the right combination of distributing technologies uh, to optimize the cost of distribution for these channels. Salax are definitely here to stay. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much for that, uh, Vincent. Uh, we're going to move on now to Gerald Wong, uh, who is the CEO of Caton Networks uh, from Caton Technology. Uh, I think that the hybrid mix, the you know, interesting presentation there, Vincent. Uh, Gerald, let you take it away to give the perspective of, of Caton Networks and how it works. Great. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. Uh, well, firstly, uh, let me say it's a it's a privilege to be invited here by ABS and AP, uh, APSCC. So I, I really look forward to sharing uh, some of what we're doing and our views here to the uh, to the audience. Um, next slide, please. So Caton Technology has been uh, helping the media and broadcast industry for over 20 years, both in media appliances and also in transmission technologies. Uh, we've constantly been uh, creating new technologies, but not just technologies, but how to apply those technologies as a service for industries like uh, satellite. Next slide, please. Caton uh, Technology, uh, we're a company that's globally headquartered out of Hong Kong. Uh, we operate in uh, many countries, including most of the Asian countries. We, ha we have operations and partnerships across the globe, including offices in LA and the UK. And in the sh short time that Caton Networks has been servicing customers in the last two years, we've built a, uh, a, a fairly impressive logo list you see on the right here. Uh, just some of our customers that we've been, do we've been sub servicing uh, from Japan to Singapore and service providers as well, including uh, fiber service providers and satellite service providers. So we've had the privilege to be working with these companies, learning from them and uh, understanding where the pain points are and how to better service them and, the, and their customers. Uh, next slide, please. So here, uh, really what we are wanting to talk about is how hybrid networks, satellite plus IP networks really can help the satellite industry, especially in distribution, uh, provide solutions for this changing environment. Uh, there's, there's no doubt that the, your customers, the customers uh, are changing today. There's uh, a more alternate screen that's uh, consumption that's being available, whether it's OTT, smart devices, phones, etc. And as a result, there's a shrinkage of ad revenues, which, which really is changing the business model of how linear TV and satellite distribution is operating. As a result, um, hybrid networks is looking to enable new business opportunities for satellite, the satellite industry and satellite providers to be able to uh, take into these new uh, business opportunities and increase market of these changing types of uh, distributions. Primarily, uh, the, the goal of hybrid networks is to lower costs uh, provide flexibility, not just fixed uh, services, but also with event-based services. There's more of those now, especially with this day and age of COVID-19. We're seeing a lot more online uh, concerts happening, concerts going into cinemas and other uh, venues. Um, remote locations, uh, this world is growing and no longer are, do we have a consolidated aggregated view of where operators are and where distribution points are. It's becoming increasingly uh, 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 distributed around the world. And of course, a changing environment in terms of regulations and uh, of, of requirements. Um, OTTs increasingly are in data centers that may not have downlink or sufficient downlink uh, capabilities. So um, again, there's increasing changing landscape. Now, this is not new to have a a hybrid network to be operating. Uh, and in the past, uh, seller operators have been working with uh, dedicated lease line fiber networks, uh, which can lower the cost, but and, and fiber network prices have decreased substantially over the last few years. However, uh, that is more in consolidated aggregated uh, points, which again, as we've seen now, we're moving much more to a 
distributed model. Uh, and this, this is where internet-based transmissions is starting to evolve the technology and the quality is becoming much more of a viable alternative. There are challenges though. So if we could go to the next slide, some of the challenges that we hear from satellite providers. On the next slide, please. Some of the challenges that we hear constantly from satellite providers is that internet is low cost, but it, it's, it only works for low bit rates. So if you're wanting to do HD or UHD, it's, it's, it won't work for that. Um, there's a, a service uh, availability issue that stream fails over distance. And is it stable enough to have an SLA? If, I'm a, if you're a satellite provider and you have a four nines or even five nines SLA that you provide to your customer, your, your SLA is only as good as your weakest link. And if the internet is contributing to the satellite uplink or even acting as a distribution to some of the remote locations, then that's a problem. Um, th most, in most instances today, uh, internet-based transmissions are a do-it-yourself. Here's a technology, here's some software, go and try to build something, figure, figure out what internet to buy, how to make it connect together. It's complicated especially if you want need to make it work and make it work in a stable, repetitive fashion. Next is that the internet is a cloud. There's very little visibility of what's happening. And so when you get a call from your customer as to, hey, my, my stream is not showing the quality or it's having, to, having uh, uh, pat errors, then where is the visibility for you to troubleshoot and ensure that you can resolve the problems? Of course, we, we're talking about a lot of remote sites as well. And, and as satellite providers, you're fairly centrally located. How do you manage those remote locations? And lastly, the most common uh, concern or common want that we hear is that you just want to focus on your business. Internet may not be a core part of your business and you would like a service just to be able to deliver uh, for you. On to the next slide, please. So, Hearing these areas of challenges and requirements, that's where Kate Technology has, has developed a, a media IP internet-based, primarily internet-based transmission network um, that is called KTNet. KTNet is primarily goal is to reduce that transmission network cost, both in the contribution and some uh, distribution provide a quality of services that complements and matches the satellite requirements. Um, and then of course, providing a unified managed service with SLA across multiple providers. Internet is made out of a lot of different uh, service providers and ISPs. How do we unify all those together and provide a service level and a service that is easily uh, consumed by the satellite provider? And lastly, to make it productize, uh, assured with global reach and local scale. So that is the vision of KTNet. And uh, you'll see that we've come a long way in the last two years in developing and executing along this vision. Uh, next slide, please. Just diving a little bit deeper into how, what we, how we've built KTNet and the, and the goal of providing this type of service to salad providers. Technology is where we've seen uh, uh, protocol, other protocols uh, doing similar things in the past, but technology alone is not enough. That's our experience and that's the feedback we've gotten from, uh, from the industry. So we've added in expertise and design knowledge of internet and networking with our 20 years of experience with broadcast and media industry. And then we've included and, and complemented with services and tools to be able to provide a service product to the satellite industry that hopefully uh, enables the satellite industry to be able to uh, uh, provide solutions for these different and changing environments. Could we go to the next slide, please? From a technology angle, one of the biggest challenge is how internet works. So we hear about Many of you have heard about things like drop packets and jitter and latency before. How much of a problem is this really? So taking uh, this view of the internet, 
by Akamai from Tokyo to London was showing at any one time a packet loss of almost 30%, a latency of 263 milliseconds over the internet. In fact, our, our experience in delivering for our customers, we've seen packet losses in mature internet countries like Japan and South Korea, just within their domestic market, constant packet loss of about 26% and spikes up to 40 to 50%. So if you don't know how to work, design and manage these areas, you would not be able to provide a service that a satellite service provider really can consume. If we go to the next slide, please. And this is because typically to the layperson, we think the internet is a straight shot. So if we're sending a transmission from Singapore to Hong Kong, for example, we think it's, the internet is connecting like we know on fiber from Singapore to Hong Kong. But really what happens on a day-to-day -day basis that the transmission gets rerouted and rerouted often. And that's where you have these increasing packet losses and also increasing latency. On a good day, for example, from Singapore to Hong Kong, the latency that we see is roughly about 40 milliseconds. But once a day, twice a day, we see it shooting up to 200 milliseconds or even 400 milliseconds, where it starts rerouting around the world. So we need a combination of technology, design experience, and services to be able to manage this and provide a stable platform and environment um, that can create a true hybrid network for satellite providers. This is where we've built an SD-WAN called uh, Katen Net. Can we go into slide, the next slide, please? In Katen Net, uh, onto the next slide, please. Yeah, in Katen Net, we are using the tech, sorry, previous slide, we've gone past one. It's just a little delay here. Um, in Katenet, we use the, techno the, the industry leading protocol technology that Katen Technology has developed, where we can, we, we can recover 100%, even up to packet losses of 50% of packet loss. But it's not just the technology alone. It's the network design that's very important to the quality and stability of the services that satellite providers are requiring. So we've built KTNet as an SD-WAN, a software-defined WAN, to be able to provide different levels of services and routability between different points. Primarily, KTNet has a private network built on internet-based technologies, but it's a private network just like a lease line. But we have multiple backup routes through ISP direct peering partnerships that we've developed and also through the public exchange as a tertiary route. So in terms of providing stability and quality, um, we have private networks, we have uh, direct networks between our partners and then only on the tertiary level that we go to the public internet exchange. Through this SD-WAN and router bid routability based on the defined SLA and quality that you require. And also depending on budgets, we can provide different solutions to meet all those different needs. On to the next slide, please. In terms of services, just as important, we uh, have wrapped our technology and design with a service practice that is based on industry uh, standards and a short service designs, inclusive of 24 by seven uh, operations in NOC and uh, having maintenance support even in remote locations. Um, definitely uh, as you're looking at remote locations, how do you service those? And through our global partnership that Katen Technology has, uh, we can service all those remote locations. And even especially through, uh, through our dashboards, we can provide each satellite provider their different view of all their services, having a view of the service levels across um, uh, their different customers. So if you go to the next slide, please. Just a snapshot of this is to be at for, for the satellite providers providing you now a, a, a visibility uh, on what's happening in the transmission stream, either in the contribution to you or the distribution, being able to see at 
each point and each segment of the internet, what's happening and what's streaming is is a uh, requirement and value that is uh, unsurpassed. So for you to be able to provide a solution to your customers. As a result, if we go to the next slide, please. Katernet is truly a broadcast level transmission network. Uh, we can do ABR and VBR, but very much CBR is our bread and butter, uh, whether it's uh, SD, HD, 4K, or even 8K, uh, KTNet is highly scalable in terms of the size of the stream and in terms of how many streams that we carry. Um, as a SD-WAN, we are highly stable in terms of providing uh, uh, the fiber and IP networks to build an, a hybrid network for cell providers and highly flexible. Today, we've reached, we've got access and reached to 35 countries, 141 cities today. Uh, and that's how large we've built KakiNet to in servicing and operating our, cur our current customers. Uh, different choices of service levels for different budgetary needs. And all of this is uh, as, as an OPEX and ease of mind to the seller provider. Could it, can we get the next slide, please? And being uh, focusing in Asia, just to show to you an Asia-centric view of how KTNet looks, we have pops of uh, pops in all the key major countries across Asia. In fact, globally into the US, Europe as well. And this is a constantly evolving map as more and more customers, as, as we're working with uh, salad providers to provide services to more and more customers. For example, uh, we're in the midst of completing our build of our Vietnam pop, which is not in here at the moment. We'll, have a, we'll soon have a pop by the end of July in both Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh. Uh, so the expanse of KTNet, the quality it can provide, the stability it provides, truly, uh, we believe, is a game changer in, de in providing a hybrid network that satellite providers can trust. Thank you. Back to you, Chris. Uh, thank you very much for that, Joe. Uh, so, uh, curious, I mean, it does definitely seem like the, there's a hybrid solution that you're putting forward with Kate and that. Um, you know, what is the what is the, the partnership that you're that you're seeking in terms of, of working with satellite operators? How is that? How does that get integrated into your your overall service offering? Um, it it could be very simple, um, and in fact, we're talking to some satellite providers in Germany and in uh, in South in, in, in Africa, where uh, it's a one-off simple software deployment. Whereas with uh, some satellite providers. Um, we, we have points of presence already within their uplink centers so that uh, there could be a, a rateable offer uh, that the sub provider has that you can offer to your customers. Uh, really, it's about increasing uh, the, the scope of the solution that the sub providers can include that contribution from the content uh, origination point to yourselves. And then also, uh, from uh, downlink points where there could be remote locations that the satellite doesn't have coverage or has poor coverage, whether uh, 5G impacted uh, areas or by regulation, some buildings may not have uh, suitable, uh, suitable downlink dishes to be able to have a hybrid network extend to those distribution points. Um, so uh, with a, a number of satellite providers already in Asia, we have those points of presence and building productized offerings with the, that their sales teams can offer to their customers. So this is, I think that, that customer uh, component, obviously that's the critical part of the piece is what, is the, what are the needs of the customers? And actually Vincent, to, to, to bring it back to you, it seems like a lot mm -hmm. of when we talk about um, the, the service offering, we talk about the, the, the role of satellites, it still very much is a B2B play. Um, so you're, when we talk about the customer segment, it isn't necessarily the viewing audience at home, it's who is the, the MSO, who is the cable, the cable operator, who, who, are your, who are your customers? But obviously they've got to think of their customers in mind. So for them, it's a B2C offering. How, how does this conversation, how has it changed over the years? Because I think 
when we went through your history slides, that was mm. very much a history that was focused on dealing with telcos, dealing with cable MSOs. That's all changed now, hasn't it? You've really got to have the complete value chain in mind as you as you go to market, don't you? Yeah, that's that's true, Chris. I think I think there's two parts uh, to to this conversation. So I think. The B two C part is still relevant. So you talk about the B two C. You're talking you're talking about the DTH operators and all these things uh, versus the OTTs, right? You know, so the the S bots and all these things they're going direct to consumers uh, from providers. Uh, but the DTH is still relevant. I mean, you, it's 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 going to be the same challenge. I think we talk about uh, one to many. So it's going to be the same challenge uh, uh, for for B two C as well. You know, so when you you talk about DDH uh, in countries like Philippines and Indonesia, it's, and and even a large country like Malaysia, uh, it's still pretty relevant. Uh, using satellites certainly more cost effective. You know, to to reach millions of subscribers out there. Uh, but I think the, the the point here is that the discussion that we have today is mainly talking about challenges for video distribution, which essentially means that we are trying to get the video to the pay TV operators in the region, you know, so so that's the B2B part of the business. And this has changed over the years. So in the past, many of them uh, uh, use satellite, uh, a large white beam satellite, C-band, especially because uh, it is more uh, resistant to rain feed uh, in this part of the world. So so in Europe, they are using KU-band, but but in, in this part of the world, they're using C-band, it's more res resistant to, to, to rain feed. And, and it, it has evolved, kind of evolved in, in, in many ways, because uh, uh, as I alluded to that in the pr presentation, uh, you have localization, you know, different programming in different market because of programming rights. So, so certain sports are more relevant for say Taiwan. So they're watching more baseball and all these things and different sports at the same timing. And, and you know, with linear programming, you have uh, uh, a certain timing that's more valuable than others. So you probably want to put, put the most relevant programs during that time. Hence, I think a lot of broadcasters have seen that and create different programming uh, for different market. Uh, but by, by creating different program for different market, you may end up with one feed for one affiliate and one customers or, or just a handful of them. And it doesn't make a lot of sense putting that on satellite in that sense. So, so the, the, the the, the evolution has changed in such a way that, you know, the role of satellite has shifted to certain market, just like how uh, it is relevant for the B2B business as well. So so in, in the Philippines, you still have many customers, you still have many uh, service provider, MSOs and all these things which we have to serve. And, and satellite remains the only option in that market, for example. If, if I may add to that point. Please, Joe. Sorry, Chris. Yeah, if I may add to that point, we're, we're seeing changes, inflections in the marketplace, not just for satellite, even for lease line operators, traditional media mm -hmm. uh, service providers, uh, some of the largest ones, uh, all of them are looking at different ways of transmitting in terms of keeping their offering and services for their customers. So a single medium is no longer, I think, relevant anymore. Everyone's looking at multiple different medium of transmissions to service a very evolving and changing customer requirement. So I, I, I truly believe the hybrid network for satellite is an offering that all satellite providers should be uh, in, including as part of the standard offering. Yeah, understood. Yeah, I think, I think the message here is then I think it, we, I mean, different technologies do not compete anymore. I think we can coexist in, in many ways to provide uh, more cost-effective means. I think that's the goal, uh, uh, what we're trying to do for the customers, right, Emilio? So I want to I, I get to the poll, which is looking at markets. We've kind of segued from markets into, you know, into slightly uh, to applicability and to the, the utility reach. Let's quickly get to the poll, and then I'm going to come back to a question that we've been given by one of the audience members. Uh, and the question is, for the Indonesian and Philippines markets, what is the best, best delivery of video content method? Satellites, satellites, and internet, fiber lease line or internet. So please, if you don't mind uh, adding that, you know, just click on the choice that you have and then enter submit. 
uh, and you'll be able to, to be pulling. But in the meantime, while we wait for those results to come in, let's get back to the question, which was about service level agreements and how do they compare between using the public internet for video distribution as opposed to using satellites for video distribution. So, Gerald, you were about to answer that. Vincent, you had, I'd like both of you to comment on it if we can do. Mm -hmm. Sure. Maybe Gerald will go first. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dave Vincent. Um, so, uh, I, I've been in the networking industry for over 20 years, uh, and having built uh, some of the lease lines and fiber networks across Asia and, and globally. Um, it's it, There's various technologies and network and designs that can be done to provide that SLA. Uh, we see that SLA needs to be complementary to what the satellite provider is offering. Today in the offer in the services that Katen provides, we have some satellite providers that require only 99%, depending on the budget the customer has. Whereas we have some customers requiring 99.99%. Uh, .99%. Today, uh, I'd say four nines SLA, stream level SLA. So not a network SLA, but a stream level SLA is the highest offering that we have today. There is an ability to build into even higher SLA, 99.995 uh, .9, uh, or 9 or five nines. It's really ending up to be a cost versus quality and service availability question. It is, uh, in, in many instances, to be honest, it may be more cost effective to buy fiber at that stage. Uh, but from an internet uh, cost reduction and providing SLA today, uh, we can provide um, four nines SLA with a very good with a very good cost reduction in the transmission service. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think I think I agree with that. I think generally that you you can see the difference in the SLA definitely. Uh, uh, with satellite, uh, we provide at least more than four nines. Uh, in that case, uh, uh, for video distribution, uh, hence you can see the difference in 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 offering in terms of. Uh, 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 delivering through the internet, you know, for example, um, I think I've alluded to that in my presentation as well just now uh, with regards to, to different market and different needs. So, so broadcasters sometimes have uh, requirements for uh, a market that they don't think is that profitable. And, and they're looking at, you know, probably a low SLA delivery and all these things, which I think we can't really do that with satellite, you know. So, so it's always been available. Satellite, you know, has high availability in that sense, and and you know they could they could create the special channels for that. You know, you can do it by fiber or or by internet delivery. Hmm. Well, very timely if we look at the the slide results, which I think are on the screens now. Um, the overwhelming majority of respondents, sixty five percent, reckon that some sort of a hybrid solution, satellite and internet solution is the right one for both the Indonesia and Philippines markets. Which is interesting because I think, you know, traditionally we don't really think of the internet component of that as being so important in both of these uh, kind of archipelago regions that, you know, there's so many islands in Indonesia and the Philippines that are never gonna get uh, a sort of fiber connection or, or you know, a cable between islands that satellite seems more important, but I guess, we also discount the growth of internet in those markets as well. Mm. Yep, but I think I think you look at it, yeah, look you look at Indonesia definitely. I think it's it, it is improving in terms of terrestrial facilities, uh, but it's still a pretty large country. I think uh, uh, we have seen a lot of satellite requirements coming from uh, the eastern side. Uh, the Papua region and all these things, uh, less so these days in, in maybe the Java Island or Jakarta and all these things. Um, Philippine, on the other hand, is, is still pretty much a, a big challenge, you know, so because uh, it's a pretty large country and it's, it's too many islands and all these things in, in, in that space. So um, I don't see that Philippines, uh, anything's going to change in the near future for the Philippines uh, in that sense that, you know, say like, Will still remain very much uh, relevant. Uh, their requirements. So there's even talk about uh, providing uh, broadband services uh, for for the Philippines via the satellite. You know, in that sense. So a couple more questions that have come in. Uh, one of them from Peter Jackson. Are there any new TV products that are being developed that would require satellite distribution? 
Um, and, and I guess that's pretty squarely uh, a question for you, Vincent. Uh, although, Gerald, if you've got mm -hmm. some thoughts as well. Uh, there's a follow-up from that, which is the H266 product. Power Pan has asked about that one. When will that be rolled out? Uh, and, and any comments on that as a new standard? So kind of a mixed bag. Here. Vincent, why don't you take it first, and then Gerald uh, with some thoughts on that as well. Yeah, uh, I think generally, I think uh, satellite video distribution over satellite will evolve. Definitely, I think you are seeing more and more demand coming from the mobility sector, right? I think uh, the areas where you have uh, video being distributed to the cruise ships, uh, to air airplanes and all these things, and this can never be replicated with uh, terrestrial technology. There's no way to do it, right, today. So so we're seeing more and more video, video distribution moving towards that area. Uh, uh, in the future, you can imagine a future where you don't have those uh, backseat monitor uh, where you're going to bring your own device everything's going to stream through uh, the internet uh, via the satellite you know for, for for that case itself so so i think we see development in that area as quite exciting there's a lot of growth in the mobility area um, yeah i mean that's that's probably one area that uh, we can see that which developing uh, on the question of h266 i think i've also seen the article this week about that uh we don't know when this is going to be a de facto standard. So so it's quite exciting because uh, uh, with every uh, standard of this compression, you are reducing the, the bandwidth requirement by half, at least, you know, in that sense. So so they have just announced it this week. So, so I believe uh, it will take some time before uh, the adoption of this standard become quite common. So we are still talking about MPEG-4 today. As, as the most used standard that we have uh, for satellite distribution. Uh, there are some areas where people have used uh, H.265, uh, which is the standard used to actually compress 4K video technology. So so I think it will take, still, still take some time, definitely. You know, um, it's 8K necessary if everyone's going to watch it on, on their mobile phone in the future. Uh, I'm not that sure that you you need really 8K of pixels on your mobile phone, you know. Depends on your um, mobile phone. Uh, <laughs> and what's really doing on your mobile phone? <laughs> but uh, I'd like to, I'd like to add as well a, a, a sorry I'd like to add as well on on the H.266. Um, obviously, H.265 has been around for a little while now, and uh, it's fairly standard to use. Where we're seeing adoption rates is still not high uh, due to uh, that the requirement of those uh, 4K and even higher bitrate content uh, coming out. Uh, it's slowly coming, but at the same time, the uh, cost of of implementing H.265 is still relatively high compared to H.264. So it's not just the technology being available, but uh, be, being available at a commercial level that is uh, implement, that can be implemented widely. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, that's obviously a, a cost that uh, companies are going to have to figure out is that willing, are they willing to, to, to pay for that implementation? What's the savings over time? Ideally, if your compression is getting it down to half the size, you know, in theory, that should actually pay for itself over a certain period of time. I, I'm not really quite sure how that equation would work, but but surely there's some sort of return on that. Yeah, uh, obviously we, we look at that quite in depth as well. Uh, one of the things that we see as a slight fallacy is that uh, that extra bit rate or that extra compression is an issue where you have dedicated bandwidth, uh, but where on the internet, a lot of areas that we work, um, bandwidth is actually quite uh, uh, prevalent. There's a lot of bandwidth at very low cost. The per megabit is actually quite low. So um, the, desire, the deep desire to drive towards a higher compression rate becomes a little bit of a nullified discussions, again, depending on the economics. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think on the satellite side, I think uh, you see, again, satellite is use as a one to many applications, right? If you're gonna have many endpoints and 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 that that setup boxes that you use to actually uh, uh, decompress that thing, decode that that signal, uh, if you're gonna need a lot more setup boxes, then that's gonna negate any gain that you have on 
the the bandwidth savings because you're going to pay a lot more for your setup boxes. I think that's primarily the case why uh, the H.265 has not been widely adopted uh, in, in many cases because it, it's going to be a lot more expensive. You're going to spend a lot more on the, the setup boxes itself. Having said that, we are starting to see the appliance makers, the IRDs, starting to come down for the, uh, in price for H.265. So it's starting to, mm. it's it's past that early adopter phase and starting to move into much more of a mature phase where those prices are expected to come down. And that's where we see H.265 being adopted much more widely. Sure. I, I mean, it, it goes along with the whole UHD 4K kind of conversation, which is, um, I think now people are really assuming that we're there in terms of 4K as a standard you know, being being widespread. Certainly, it's very hard to buy any kind of a TV set or a monitor that doesn't have 4K. And yet, we're not really seeing the satellite distribution of that. That has become uh, more of a, a, an internet, feed, your, your Netflix 4K, some of the streaming services, OTC services are, are, are giving you the 4K option, but we're not so much seeing that in satellite. Is that an evolution that we're expecting to happen sooner rather than later? Because it's something we talked about for a long time. Yeah, I think I think there are a few channels putting up on 4K. I think the the Premier League is available on 4K. Uh, uh, some some pay TV operators in the region, like Astro, has already uh, got some uh, 4K content, 4K channels available uh, on the bouquet itself. Uh, uh, I've seen. I think. Pay TV operators will use that to differentiate themselves from 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 uh, the OTT players itself. Uh, I I believe this this is going to be a growing trend. You know, more pay TV operators are going to offer that uh, uh, as a add-on service. Today is an add-on service, but I think in the in the near future, it's I think it's going to be a de facto as part of the bouquet. You know, and and we, we should we should be seeing more more options of that. You know, so um, traditionally it's been constrained by satellite bandwidth. They don't have enough capacity on satellite to offer 4K channels. You know, you know, on mass and all these things. But I think it's going to get get more popular. You know, for for them to differentiate. I think it's essentially going to get to the point where it's going to be a marketing decision. You know, whether. Uh, it's going to differentiate the product from 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 the competition. Let's move a little bit to talk about a different sort of, of technology rather than the compression thing. One of the things we're looking at is uh, is the, the the Leo constellations that we've been we've seen getting around, mm. um, being launched and being talked about, and it's it's really the flavor of the month and. and, and this seems like the area of new development for a lot of the, the satellite operators and startup satellite companies around. Is that something that, that we see is applicable to video distribution? It seems like mostly they're looking for internet connectivity, uh, rather, or, you know, in mm. some cases, different use cases, uh, Earth observation, whatever it happens to be, but not really focused on video distribution. Is that something that we're yeah. seeing as applicable? Is it realistic? Is it, is it on the cards? Yeah, I, th I think I think going going forward, I think uh, uh, there there will not be any distinction uh, of what data that's being carried over the satellite. Right? I think in the past, video seems to be you know the the, the only uh, applications that is very important uh, to be carried over the satellite. Going forward, I think connectivity uh, is, is going to be the discussion going forward. Whether you use it on Leo, MIOS, or, or Geo satellite, uh, this is going to be. Uh, uh, purely data. So the, un the underlying data, whether it's video, whether it's going to be pure uh, data communication or, or even voice, uh, uh, it's it's not going to be matter anymore. Yeah. In terms, um, of, in terms of looking at the, Joe, go ahead. Sorry. I, I think, especially with Leo, there will be suitable challenges as well, uh, especially as the mm. uh, as as it's not geo fixed. Um, you're going to just like internet, uh, as it is being designed for internet, has routing challenges between the different Leo satellites. So uh, I think that's going to cause a challenge for um, for media transmission and distribution, uh, and, and the same thing. I guess the same challenge that we and KT Technology is are looking to to help uh, solve as well. 
Very good. So um, you've got about uh, uh, another another seven or eight minutes left in the time that we've allotted for this. Uh, I'd like to try uh, another poll question. Um, <laughs> that is really to sort of take our last uh, the, the last sort of, uh, waypoint that I, I wanted to touch on, which is which is to look forward to the future uh, and really see what. Uh, the role or how much longer there is a significant role for video distribution uh, via satellite in the future. So the question is, is framed, uh, will satellite services and distribution for video be around for the next five years, the next 10 years, or infinitely, or indefinitely? Infinitely is probably too strong. Indefinitely, <laughs> it is not going away. Um, so please do uh, tick your box there and submit your answers. But in the meantime, I throw the question out to each of you. Gerald, uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts in terms of the, the satellite services? Obviously, you do have a, 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 a leg in each camp. You know, what, do you, what do you reckon? Um, I see that they're really, at the moment, I can't see anything that replaces the satellite, especially for wide distribution. Um, having a leg in both camps, as you said, um, uh, fiber, internet uh, reachability is constrained. Uh, you really need large uh, areas of, of population for, for infrastructure to be built for, uh, for terrestrial. And uh, the cost per megabit, there's, there's a, there will be a bottoming out where uh, the consumption model of, co of cost per megabit on, on fiber it makes it more costlier than satellite. So for wide, large distributions, uh, satellite will always be there. Uh, again, I think there's a changing landscape where uh, we need to look at how things, how both satellite and terrestrial needs to work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's that's precisely what what we have been uh, discussing, right? I mean, in this panel itself, I think you know you're looking at different types of applications. I think, uh, are you looking at, you know, for example, a wide distribution? Is it satellite that's more suitable? So I think generally, I think that's that's precisely, I think what we, 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 we have agreed in, in this uh, presentation itself, that, you know, wide distribution satellites are the solution. And of course, I think the role has changed as well. I think uh, uh, as, as a service provider or a satellite provider, we're looking for solution for, for the customers, for the broadcasters, right? I mean, and, and that, and Tails having both the satellite and also uh, some terrestrial uh, technology. So it really does kind of come full circle. Um, up on the screens now, you should be seeing the results of this. And again, maybe it's a, a, a question of the, the people who are attending the call as well right now. Uh, but there's a very strong feeling that, uh, that, that indefinitely or perhaps infinitely uh, satellite services and distribution <laughs> are not going away. So they'll, they'll be, you know, and it will be in, into the, the, the 23rd century and beyond, we will still be using satellites. Um, that's very reassuring. So we're gonna, we're gonna wrap this up a little bit earlier uh, than I expect. We still have a couple more minutes. Uh, I don't see any new questions coming in, uh, but that pretty much does it in terms of the, the, the areas for discussion that we had already set up. So I just wanna thank you both very much uh, Gerald Wong, uh, the CEO of Caton Networks, uh, subsidiary of Caton Technology. Uh, thank you for your insights from here in Hong Kong. Uh, and Vincent Lim, VP of Sales for Asia Media at ABS, uh, joining us from KL. Thank you very much for your time as well. And thank you all of you who joined the, the, the conversation. And uh, actually, and just to make sure we get one last question in, uh, Fred Kwa has sent in a question is content demand from COVID-19 at the rural area driving up demand for satellite distribution? So let's, I guess the final thing is to talk about the, the, the COVID-19 virus. How is that changing everything? And do we see that carrying on as the virus starts to come back or starts to go away? Final thoughts? Uh, yeah, two and a half yeah I, I can go. Yeah, I can go first. Yeah, I think definitely, I think we have seen demand going up in terms of people are locked at home. And and they are watching more TVs than ever. I think there's a few reports that came out uh, last month that shows that you know people are spending more time, more minutes on TV, uh, and that that goes to the point where you know that's the benefit of satellite, uh, uh, but it's coming out very clearly, right? 
you see the report Netflix had to reduce the bit rate because they're simply running out of bandwidth to 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 to, to serve these extra minutes or extra viewing hours and all these things from from consumer. Satellite wouldn't have that problem, right? I mean, if if uh, uh, you you put it on satellite uh, uh, for for video distribution, you know the cost is not going to go up tremendously if if consumers going to watch more. So so with OTT, you have that sort of dilemma because you got to pay a lot more to the CDN providers uh, if your subscriber is going to consume more on, on, on CDN, you see, more on OTT. Um, firstly, my viewpoint on that is that the virus, the, the, the virus probably will never go away, whether it's COVID-19 or something else. Uh, we live in a globalised world that uh, this probably is going to be the new norm that we need to be able to deal with. Um, I agree that satellite provides a much more wider distribution and capability, but it's about flexibility. How do you get that content to the uplinks site now? Um, so you have a lot more uh, uh, bands playing their own, own homes and uh, home production being done. How do you enable that broadcast quality still in, 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 the, in, in content to be contributed to the satellite provider? Very good. Um, other questions, of course, have come in at the last minute, which is the nature of the beast. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't have time to address them. But thank you very much uh, to those of you who have provided them. Uh, I'm thinking of Alex Tan and David Lum. Appreciate it, but we don't have time to get to them. Uh, and John Ting just sneaking in under the wire with a question that we're not going to answer. Uh, thank you all very much for participating today. Uh, we look forward to you joining us for the next of our E-series, which will be on uh, China startup space. Uh, and that will be happening uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Please look for your emails. You'll get all the information about that. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you again very much for joining us on the APSCC E-Series. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.